Welcome to the Financial Foundations Seminar. And we're going to be looking at, as the name would imply, building financial foundations. And uh, God just gave me a picture of building a house. And uh, anybody that's ever been involved in construction, or even if you haven't been involved in construction, how many know that you have to build a house in sequence? If you want to build a house, you don't go out there and put up some studs and then put up a roof and then say, oh, we forgot the foundation. Let's try to dig under the wood that we already put up. Or you go and put the drywall and then you say, oh, we forgot the wiring, the plumbing, the electrical. And you go try to put that in after you've put the drywall. Anybody know that doesn't work too well? I see people do that all the time with their finances. And so uh, we're going to be talking in this seminar about some principles that are like putting the foundation, putting the, the studs, putting the electrical, the plumbing, the drywall, the roof, all the various things you need to have in order to have a, a, a house that will stand, a house that you can live in, a house that will protect you, a house that you can use for something valuable. And uh, if you do these things out of sequence or out of order, they don't work too well. And what I've found, a lot of people, I hear a lot of people that have heard something on television, you know, maybe a teaching that somebody gave, and then they'll do that thing and they'll come back and say, you know, I tried that, that doesn't work. I tried what that guy on TV said, it doesn't work. And I found a lot of times what the problem was, they tried to do step five before they did one, two, three, or four. Somebody was trying to put up a roof and they hadn't put a foundation yet. And so these things that we're going to talk about do need to be done in sequence and, uh, and each one needs to be completed as you move on to the next one. It doesn't mean that it needs to be 100% complete, but you need to be moving in the direction of having one thing in order before you begin to try to move on to the next one, or it is indeed true that uh, these things don't work too well. And so Jesus said himself in Matthew chapter 7, verse 24, Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain descended, the floods came, the winds blew and beat on the house, and it did not fall. It was founded on the rock. And that's what we're looking at is building a house, uh, a personal financial house that's founded on a rock. Because how many know winds will come? Waves will come. And uh, things will shake your house, and if it's not secure, if it's not really built upon a secure foundation on a rock, winds will knock it over, waves will knock it over. Economies go up, economies go down, things change, and if your financial house is not built upon solid foundations, then it will fall over, and that, uh, that creates a problem in the future. Now, we're going to look at this from a biblical perspective, and... Uh, and really from the perspective of the kingdom of God, does the Bible have anything to say about finances? You know, what's a very inter interesting statistic is that in the New Testament alone, there are 215 verses on faith, 218 verses on salvation, and 2,084 verses on money and finance. In other words, 10 times more is said in the New Testament about money and finance than about faith or salvation, which most of us would think are probably pretty important topics. Now the question obviously is, why would Jesus talk ten times more about money and finances than about faith or salvation? Was he a money grubber? I mean, he came to earth, you know, to fund his ministry to get money. No, I don't think so. But why, did, why were 16 of Jesus' 38 parables about money and finance? Well, not because he was after money. What was Jesus actually after? The heart. He wasn't after money. He was after your heart. He said in Matthew chapter 6, verse 21, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. And what Jesus discovered is a whole lot of people carry a whole lot of treasure in their money. And if he could capture their money, he could capture their heart. And I believe that's why he spoke quite a lot about money. He wasn't after people's money. He was after their whole life. He was after their heart. And so uh, as we go through this seminar and we look at this, we're going to look at it from uh, two sides, from two perspectives. Uh, because I have found that everything we do, we want to do by faith. Isn't that true? We want to trust God in every area, every aspect of our lives, and finances would be no exception to that. And so we want to walk by faith. 
But I found here's an interesting thing. Another scripture that the Lord quickened to me years ago in John chapter 4, verse 23 and 24, Yeshua said this, The hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father is seeking such to worship Him. God is spirit, and those who worship Him must worship in spirit and in truth. I began thinking about that. Spirit and truth. That's like a balance between two different things. The spirit side of faith is believing God to receive those things which He has said. In other words, operating in faith toward His Word, toward what He has said. We know Romans chapter 10, verse 17 tells us this. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. So we're going to hear things that the Word has said, and we're going to grab hold of them and let them become engrafted within us, and faith rises up to see the manifestation of those things that God has spoken to us by covenant. That's one aspect of it. But how many have heard that phrase spoken of someone, he's uh, so heavenly minded, he's of no earthly good. And you find sometimes in finances, we've probably all met people, maybe some of us are people, who have no practical principles in our life, but bless God by faith. We're just believing God for everything to, to happen the way we uh, believe it should happen, and yet violating practical, basic principles of life. And that's the truth side. The truth side is basic principles. And uh, here we find an interesting parable that, that uh, Jesus told in Luke chapter 17. And by the way, sometimes I like to call Jesus by His Hebrew name, Yeshua. So if you hear me say Yeshua, that's the same as Jesus. Je uh, Jesus is the Greek and Yeshua is the Hebrew. So uh, sometimes I'll use either one, Yeshua or Jesus. So in Luke chapter 17, verse 5, And the apostles said to the Lord, Increase our faith. So this is going to be about faith. That's their question. Increase our faith. So the Lord said, If you have faith as a mustard seed, you can say to this mulberry tree, Be pulled up by the roots and be planted in the sea, and it would obey you. And which of you, having a servant plowing or tending sheep, will say to him, when he has come in from the field, Come at once and sit down to eat. But will he not rather say to him, Prepare something for my supper, gird yourself, and serve me till I have eaten and drunk, and afterwards you will eat and drink? Does he thank the servant because he did the things that were commanded him? I think not. So likewise you, when you have done all those things which you are commanded, <coughs> you say, We are unprofitable servants. We have done what was our duty to do. Now you hear that and you say, What on earth does that have to do with faith? I mean, they said increase our faith, and he's telling this story about a servant that came in and did what he was told. And I was asking the Lord that question, what does that have to do with faith? And here's what I heard the Holy Spirit say. He said, faith not only comes by hearing, faith also comes by obedience to those things that you hear the Spirit of God say. So, in other words, obedience generates faith. Yeshua is telling this parable saying, when you're a servant, you come in and your job is to obey what your master tells you to do. That's how your faith is going to be increased, by obeying what your master tells you to do. And of course, we know the scripture that says in James, don't be just hearers of the word, but be doers as well. So on the, on the principle side, we want to be not just hearers and not just saying, I believe, Lord, and I receive, but are there some practical action steps of things that we actually need to do? Maybe some choices we need to make, some changes we need to make, some things we need to do, and of course that's true. Also, if you look at the spirit and the truth side, I think of it oftentimes in terms of flying, uh, partly because I'm a pilot and I like to fly. But uh, how many would like to fly with a spiritual pilot that had no value for the truth principles? In other words, you got in the airplane and, and you just were asking some questions. You said, uh, what speed do you normally take off at? He said, oh, I don't know. Uh, the co-pilot and I usually just sort of pray as we're going down the runway and whatever occurs to us, that's the speed we use. You know, well, what altitude do you fly at? Well, the airplane has the capacity to fly anywhere between 0 and 40,000 feet, and we noticed that... Uh, Exodus has uh, 40 chapters in it, so we usually just sort of turn to Exodus and we let the Bible fall open to whatever chapter, and then that's the altitude that we use. And, well, how much weight can this airplane carry? Oh, I don't know. It differs from day to day. We just sort of pray, and, and we're just led by the Spirit every time. Now, how many want to fly with that guy? You know, 
Probably not. Why? Because you want somebody that understands and operates in the truth principles that goes by the manual of the manufacturer that says how high it can fly and how much it can carry and what speed you take off and land at. But wouldn't you want a pilot that actually operated in both? The pilot that operates in the truth principles, but yet as he's flying, can hear the Holy Spirit say, there's danger along this route today. Don't go this direction. Today, take this alternate route because it's safer. There's danger over here. I would want to be with the pilot that understands both truth and, uh, and uh, also operates in the spirit. And so we want to function that way in finances, spirit and truth, both of these things. Now, we're going to look also at the kingdom of God and the world system because what we find is we have these two things that are functioning at the same time on the earth. And we need to learn how to function in the world system and we need to learn how to function in the kingdom of God. And the primary operative uh, uh, thing, uh, the, the primary function that's operative in the kingdom of God is giving and receiving the primary thing that's operative in the world system is buying and selling. We need to know how to do both. Wouldn't it be true that we need to understand buying and selling? We need to understand giving and receiving. We need, need to know how to function in both. Now, the kingdom of God primarily functions through multiplication. We see parables, for example, where Yeshua talks about 30, 60, and 100 fold multiplication. And yet the world system is primarily talking about percentage increase. So people get excited if somebody says, you could make 20% or 30% or 40%. People think that would be a good investment. And yet in the kingdom of God, we're seeing 30-fold. What percent is that? See, that's not even a percent. That's times, 30 times or uh, a hundred times. So in the kingdom of God, there's multiplication. And you know, there's something I found in the spirit of man that knows multiplication is supposed to exist. And the devil sets up a counterfeit of multiplication, which is gambling. Gambling is really counterfeit multiplication. You know why so many people get excited about lotteries or, or gambling? Because basically, gambling has to do with multiplication. Somebody doesn't buy a lottery ticket for a dollar hoping to get back a dollar thirty. Right? No, they buy the lottery ticket hoping to get back millions of dollars, the multiplication. So there's something inside us that knows multiplication is supposed to be there. We just don't, many people don't know how to enter into it, don't know how to function in it. And so I believe in these days, especially, God wants to teach us how do we move from the world system of percentage increase into God's system of multiplication. Multiplication, that's an exciting thing. Now, we're going to talk in this session also about provision. Because when we're talking about finances, one of the very foundational things that's critical for every one of us is provision. Isn't that true? One of the, the very first things that people think of is, I need provision. I need to eat. I need clothing. I need shelter. I need basic necessities of life. And how is that going to happen? How is provision going to take place for me? I began thinking of that word and uh, in English and most Latin languages. It's an interesting word because it's a, a prefix attached to a root word. And so the prefix is pro and the root is vision. What does pro mean? Pro actually means for or in favor of. And so when we're talking about provision that comes to us, provision is that which comes to you for what? The vision, right, for the vision. So here's the first critical key. Before we can even talk about provision, we have to talk about vision. And the reason is, if we don't have vision, what happens to us according to the Bible? Without vision, people perish. So if we don't have a vision, the Bible says we're in danger of perishing. So the first thing is we have to have a vision because if we don't have a vision, there's no need for provision because provision is that which comes to you from God for the vision. 
So the key question is, what's the vision? What I'm saying is this. Many people begin to focus on money and finances before they focus on vision. And what I'm saying is, no, we want to start with vision. What's the vision? What's the purpose? What's the calling? What am I to do? I really began to recognize that as, as I would talk to people on airplanes as I'd travel. I'd be traveling around and sit next to people on uh, airliners, and I'd begin to ask them the normal questions of, what do you do for a living? And, and uh, you know, they'd say, I represent this company, or I sell this product, or I, I do this kind of work, or I, I have this trade, or I drive this truck, or whatever it is that they do. And, uh, and then I'd ask them, uh, how long have you been doing that? Sometimes people would say, uh, 20 years, 25 years, 30 years. I'd say, uh, do you like that kind of work? And do you know 70 or 80 percent of the time people go, not really. And sometimes people would say, I hate that work. And on occasion, not every time, but sometimes I'd ask them the next sort of obvious question. Let me get this straight. You do this thing 40, 50, 60 hours a week for the last 25 years, and you hate it? You don't like it? The obvious question, why? Why would you do that? And they look at you with that duh type of look. I mean, well, obviously the reason I do that is I need the money. Well, what if you press that one step farther and say, why do you need the money? They'll look at you like, well, isn't that really obvious? I mean, I need the money to pay my bills, to pay for my house, my car, my, my clothes, my food. And sometimes I'd actually ask them the next question. If you just keep pressing, why? Why do you need house, clothes, car, food? And again, they look at you like, what kind of a kook are you? And I'd say, no, really, honestly, I want to know. I, I want to hear your answer. Why do you need those things? And they say, well, because without those things, I'll die. And then I'd ask the next question. Why do you need to live? Now we're getting down to the basic root foundation question. What are you here for? Why do you need to live? Now, here's the sad, honest truth. Do you know when we got to that question, most people could not answer it. They couldn't tell you. They'd just give you a blank stare like, nobody ever asked me that. And I never thought of that. And so, what is provision for that person? See, that which comes for what? They don't know. They honestly don't know. We need to know. See, I don't believe God put us on the planet for no reason. He had a reason in His mind. There are things that He wanted for us to accomplish on this planet that nobody else could, could accomplish. Things that you can do that nobody else can do. And the sad truth is I found that many, many people did not pursue vision in their life. They pursued money. If you look at what happened to many people when they got out of, got out of uh, their primary education, whatever it was, high school or college, university, trade school, whatever it is, their, their education, and they began to make a career selection. How am I going to spend time? What am I going to begin to do? Do you know how most people made that choice? They did whatever gave them the most money. And what they did without realizing it at that very moment is they signed up to be a slave. I listened to people and, and asked them, why do you do that work? I have to. I work for money. You know that very phrase, I work for money, they just told you who their master is, their boss. Money. They have to consult money for everything in their life. That is their boss. That structures their life. That governs who they are. That governs what they do. And what, I, what I'm telling you is, I don't believe God intended for us to live that way. He did not put us on planet Earth to serve money. He put us on planet Earth to serve a vision, to serve a purpose, to serve a destiny. And, and because most of our cultures function that way, most of the people on planet Earth choose how they spend their adult life that way, based on money. And without realizing it, they've made themselves a servant, made themselves a slave, and they find themselves 25 years down the road doing something they really don't like. And, uh, you know, I thought, in reality, the way God intended for this to work is we were not to serve money. 
Money was to serve us, we're to serve God. Money's just a tool that is designated to accomplish a purpose that God gives us. Money's not an end in and of itself. See, if you get those reversed and you get that mixed up, what ends up happening is you end up making money the goal and then asking God to be the servant to get you money. Now, how many think that's backwards? See, God is not the servant. God is the master. He's the one that we serve. We're supposed to serve Him, receive vision from Him, find out what He wants us to do, and then we press money into service to do that, to accomplish that. So money is a servant that's designed to serve a vision. Money is not the master that puts us in fear, and then full of fear we go to God and beg Him, please don't let me perish. Please get me enough money. And that's where a lot of people live, is in that latter one. And I believe God wants to make a paradigm shift, wants to shift that for us so that we come back in line. No, He's the master. I'm His servant. Money is no master at all. Money's just a tool that I press into service to accomplish the purpose He gave me. So the issue is, what's your vision? What has God actually called you to do? What burns in your heart? What is it that you long to do? What is it that God designed you to do? Find that. And if you find yourself in a place where, where you're saying, you know, I'm in a trap. I really am one of those people doing something I don't want to do, that I hate to do. And uh, I do it every day because I don't know what else to do. Do you know I believe God has a transition mechanism for you? And as you begin to say, just seek Him. God, how do I change? What do you want me to do? To, so that I can begin to pursue my vision, I believe God will open that up. God will show you. Don't believe lies like, it's too late, you're too old, if only you would have done this a long time ago. No, you can do that at any time. Don't let the enemy uh, present to you circumstances and say, no, it's not for you, you're trapped, you're stuck. That's a lie. And, and you know, if you're experiencing that and you go, that's a nice theory, brother, but I really am trapped. When we have a time of prayer, please come up here and let somebody pray for you because that needs to be broken over your life so that you can be released, really to pursue the vision, what, uh, what God gave you and put you on the planet to do. Now, let's look over in Matthew chapter 6, verse 24. And now uh, we're going to look at a, another uh, scripture here, where, uh, which is very interesting. Yeshua said here something uh, about two masters. In verse 24 he said, No one can serve two masters. Either he'll hate the one and love the other, or else he'll be loyal to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Now most of us have heard that scripture. I always thought all my adult life that mammon was just another word for money. As a matter of fact, I know one of our translations in English actually translates that verse, money. You can't serve God and money. But the word actually is not money, it's mammon. And uh, I began wondering, well, what is it if it's not money? And, and then what is it? Here's how I began to realize it wasn't money. Because Jesus sets these two things up as opposites. This is God, this is mammon, they're opposites. If you serve this one, you should have nothing to do with this one. If you have something to do with this one, you're not serving this one. He sets it up that way. So if it's money, then if I really want to serve God, what's the obvious conclusion? I shouldn't have anything to do with money. I shouldn't have any of it. No bank account. I should take a vow of poverty. You see. And I began to realize, no, I don't think that's what God has called me to anyway. And, and maybe not, uh, probably not most people. So it can't mean money. Because whatever it is, we're to have nothing to do with it. So, so I don't think it's money. So what is it? I didn't know for years until a friend of mine, Earl Pitts, uh, he and I co-authored a book, Wealth, Riches, and Money. A friend of Earl's in Youth with a Mission, Ron Smith, did a study on the origin of that word money. And uh, what he told us was that as he studied that out, he discovered that that, or pardon me, not the origin of the word money, the origin of the word mammon. What he told us is, it was actually a Canaanite 
word from a, a Canaanite language, and it was the proper name of a god that was worshipped by Canaanite peoples in the days of Jesus. In other words, it's like the word Baal or Chemosh or Molech or Dagon, one of the gods that were worshipped by Canaanite peoples. And so when Yeshua says, you can't serve God, he's talking about the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of Israel, Jehovah, the God of the universe. You cannot serve God and this other God, Mammon, because they're two separate spiritual entities. So the problem is, these are two separate spiritual entities. What are they both competing for? What do they want? What we said in the beginning, your heart. They're both after your heart. So there's a conflict of love. This one wants your love and affection and heart. This one wants your love and affection and, and heart. And the issue is, which one do you give your heart to? Which one do you love? You see, and that ties in with what uh, Paul told us in, in 1 Timothy, where he said, the love of money is the root of all evil. He didn't say the money is the root of all evil. What's the problem? It's a love that goes after money. Now, this spirit of mammon, what does this thing do? How does it work? What I began to think of was this. Behind every one of those idolatrous gods that we saw are demonic entities, demonic principalities that function. Now, do you think those demonic principalities were just in the Middle East and just 2,000 years ago? Or do you think that some of them might still be alive today and might still influence somebody's life today in a Western country? I think so. Do you think there might be a spirit behind that God mammon? I think so. Do you think that spirit might influence anybody? I think so. What does that spirit do? What do demonic principalities do? What do they want? You know what they want? They want your worship. They want your love. They want your allegiance. They want you to give them allegiance and give your heart to them. Now, here's the obvious point. If the spirit of mammon were to walk up to anyone here in this meeting today and say, Hello, I'm the spirit of mammon. Bow down and serve me and give me your heart allegiance. Who would do it? Nobody. Nobody would do that. So how does that spirit have to function to gain our allegiance? That thing has to deceive, has to work through deception, has to trick us into doing it without knowing that we're doing it. How does he do that? Money. Now this is a piece of paper. This is amoral. This isn't good. It's not evil. Has no virtue, has no evil to it. It's just a piece of paper. It's amoral. That spirit hides behind this stuff and does two things with it. That spirit, first of all, says, this is where the real power is. If you have a lot of this stuff, you're a very, very powerful person. And if you don't have any of this stuff, you're a very impotent person. Now, is that the truth? That's not the truth, is it? Do you know that that spirit even values human lives in this stuff? See, that spirit motivates people to say, Did you realize he's worth $46 billion? Now, is that the value of that man? No, not in the sight of God. But see, that spirit values human life in terms of this stuff. That spirit says, this is where the real power is. See, if you have this stuff, you're powerful. If you don't have any of this, you're impotent. And that is not the truth. Just think back to the 1929 depression when the stock market crashed and people who had lots of this stuff one day all of a sudden didn't have much of it the next day. And see, all of a sudden, their whole perception of life changed. But did their value change? No, their value was the same. They just didn't realize it. They didn't know it. First thing that spirit does is to get you to place inordinate value on money. The second thing that that spirit does is to get you to fear the lack of it. Do you know when, the prime, when, when they go out and do polls in Western nations, they say, what keeps you awake, pardon me, what keeps you awake at night? You know, what do you fear more than anything else? What bothers you? One of the primary things people say is, fear I'm not going to have enough money. I'm going to lose my house. I'm going to lose my car. I'm not going to be able to eat. My children are going to not have food or not be able to be educated or whatever. So there's a, a deep, deep fear in people's hearts. I think there's a spirit behind that, motivating that. That spirit of mammon is working like that. Now, what I found in managing money, which is what we're going to talk about here in this seminar, 
How do we manage this stuff? What do we do with this stuff called money? How do we manage it? Managing money, to me, is like this little picture. Standing on a soccer ball in a swimming pool. Have you ever gotten in a swimming pool and taken a soccer ball and you can push that thing down in the water and you can sit on it. It'll buoy you up out of the water a little ways. You can push it even down farther and you can stand on it and it'll buoy you up out of the water. But what is that ball always trying to do? It's always trying to escape back to the surface. So you put it under your feet and it starts trying to come up this side so you shift your weight over here and then it starts coming up this side. You shift your weight back over here. How many know it's not static? You're constantly, dynamically having to move to govern this thing, to manage it, to keep it where you put it. It's always trying to escape to the surface. And I began thinking about that. Do you know the ball is not the problem? The ball is like money. The ball's not the problem. What's creating all the problem? The air in the ball. <laughs> the air is like the spirit of mammon. The air is the spirit of mammon. The ball is the money. We push it down under our feet. How many know if there, were no, if there was no air in that ball at all, you could easily just put it down under your feet and it would stay there. It's the air that causes the problem. That air is like the spirit of mammon, causing that ball to constantly try to come back up and get on top of you. And so as you're managing money, there's a battle, and the longer you work with it, the more you get used to being able to keep that thing governed under your feet, the easier it becomes. But in the beginning, a lot of people have had that thing on top of them for many years of their life. And to get that under their feet to where it actually stays where they put it is a major task for a lot of people. And, uh, you know, I, I just say at this point, one of the things that we found more helpful than anything else is going through an accountability follow-up group from this seminar where you meet with uh, fellow peers for uh, a 10-week process and allow these principles to get worked out in your life. And now uh, we found that to be uh, more helpful in actually getting this done than uh, almost anything else. And so the problem is we've got this spirit that's impacting people, spirit of mammon. And uh, I think that that spirit governs entire nations, governs cultures of people. And by and large, people don't realize it. People don't realize that there's a spiritual Im impact in their lives. That's why so many people make decisions regarding finances. They'll go to a seminar like this. They'll get loaded up with knowledge. They'll make decisions and they'll say, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. I'm changing this. We're going to do this this way and that that way. And you talk to them six months later and say, how's it going? And their, their eyes will immediately hit the ground. Not too well. What happened? Well... For some reason, they just didn't follow through and it didn't happen. Do you know, I always used to think that's lack of discipline. But in recent times, I've been thinking that is a huge, a huge part of that is the influence of that spirit of mammon. It's captured their mind, captured their heart, and is impacting them in a way that they didn't realize. And it's not just a lack of discipline. It's that there's a spiritual force that is functioning against them that they've allowed into their life and never broken its power. And what we'll do uh, at the end of the second session tonight, we'll pray to break the power of that spirit of mammon over our own lives and, uh, and begin to take authority over it and to, uh, and to not allow it to function anymore. Well, let's go on in this scripture in uh, Matthew uh, that we're looking at, chapter 6, verse 24. We read, No one can serve two masters. He'll either hate one and love the other, be loyal to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. This other God, Mammon. Yeshua said, therefore, I say to you, therefore means because of what I just said. In other words, because of that, I say to you, do not worry about your life. Now, what are huge numbers of people spending lots of time doing? Worrying about their life. As a matter of fact, some people can't find enough time in the day to worry about their life, so they lie awake at night and worry about their life. <laughs> and... Uh, and Jesus said, don't do that. Don't worry about what you shall eat, what you shall drink, nor about your body, what you shall put on. Is life not more than food and the body more than clothing? And here's a very interesting thing that he says. He's going to now give us his model for provision. How is provision supposed to come to us? How are we going to be provided for? He's going to tell us. And you know, he says a very interesting thing that, that shifted my perspective on this. All of my adult life, 
I had heard teaching on sowing and reaping. Anybody ever heard that? You know, if you give, you'll receive back. Now, that is indeed a true principle. But what I discovered here is the purpose of sowing and reaping is actually not for your provision. Sowing and reaping is indeed a correct principle, but its purpose is not for your provision. And so let's look at, at what uh, Jesus says here about His model of how provision works. He says, look at the sparrows, or the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap, nor gather into the barns. Well, that's interesting. His model is the birds, the sparrows. And what's the first thing they don't do? They don't sow or reap. Wait a minute, all the people are busy trying to be provided for by sowing and reaping. And Yeshua says, that's not, my, that's not my system of provision. That's not how I do that. Not that sowing and reaping is not a valid principle. It absolutely is. It's just not for that purpose. So he said, look at these sparrows. They neither sow nor, sow nor reap nor gather into barns. They don't hoard. They don't sow and reap. What do they do? He says, verse 26, Yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? Here's what he's saying. Provision doesn't come through sowing and reaping. Provision comes for one reason and one reason only. You have a Father in heaven who loves you, and by His grace, He wants to provide for you because of His love. Now the amazing, that is a revelation that I, I, I think most of us need to take in, because you know what's happened to most of us? We have, in the depths of our hearts, determined that everything in this life works according to our performance. In other words, I have to do something or nothing will happen. I have to work. I have to provide. I have to do this. I have to do that. And I've come to call this principle sparrow faith. Sparrow faith. And so in the very first foundational place on, on line number one, in your uh, workbook, you can put sparrow faith under the truth side. That's the very first truth principle, sparrow faith. Here's what it means. It means I get a revelation in my heart. My Father in heaven loves me and He provides for me because of His love and because of His grace. Another picture that Jesus uses to, to talk about this is a child. A child. He says, we're to become like children. Think about a child. Anybody here have children? How about little children? You know, like four, five, six years old. How much time does your three, four, five-year-old spend worrying about food? How, how am I going to eat? And, and everybody's laughing because the answer is zero. In most of our cultures, our little children don't spend any time worrying about clothing, food, shelter, basic necessities of life. Why? One real simple reason. They have parents who love them and take care of that, right? I mean, how ridiculous would it be for a little four-year-old to be in fear all the time? I don't know whether I'm going to have food. No, dad and mom provide that. We don't know where it comes from. It just sort of shows up on the table every day, but you know, it's there and so, I, no, I don't spend any time thinking about that or worrying about that. How ridiculous would it be if a little child got in his, his or her mind, my provision was dependent upon my performance? I mean, think of this re regarding your own children. On the naughtiest day of their life, did you throw them outside and go, that's it, no shelter, no food, no clothing. You're out. You know, probably we didn't do that to our children. Probably on the naughtiest day of their life, you still fed them. You still clothed them. You still gave them a place to live. Right? Why? One simple reason. You loved them. You loved them. And that's why. With little children. That's how we do that. And that's what Jesus is saying. That's the, that's what I, that's the revelation. Have you seen birds recently, sparrows, having an, an anxiety attack? You know, there's, the sparrows are, ah, 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 I've got to find some food. Oh, where's a worm? Oh, I'm going to die. <gasps> you don't see sparrows going around like that. Why? The sparrows are at peace. They know they're loved. 
They're cared for. Let me read you a little poem. Said the sparrow to the robin, I would really like to know why these anxious human beings rush about and worry so. Said the robin to the sparrow, I think that it must be they have no heavenly father such as cares for you and me. In other words, the birds have more faith than the people. We need to get a revelation to have at least as much faith as the birds do that our Father loves us. So here's what I tell people. Next time that fear hits you, I'm not going to be okay. We're not going to be taken care of. Have a look out the window. If the sparrows are still there, be at rest. Jesus said the Father loves you more than them. If they're okay, you're for sure going to be okay. Now, the day there's no sparrows out there, no birds at all, you can fear on that day. <laughs> all right? But as long as he's taking care of the birds, you can be at peace. I call that sparrow faith. We need to get a revelation of that. Childlike faith. He's our source. So what, what's supposed to happen in my heart? I come into a rest, a peace. I'm going to be taken care of. My Father loves me. I'm going to be okay. Let me just read you a, a scripture. Uh, I'm going to read this out of the Amplified from Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5 and 6. And boy, this one, I think you ought to, you ought to print this one out and put it on your mirror, you know, where, where you brush your teeth every day or something that you see every single day. And here's what it says in the Amplified. Let your character or moral disposition be free from the love of money including greed, avarice, lust, and craving for earthly possessions. Be satisfied with your present circumstances and with what you have. For He, God Himself, has said... Now, who said this? Yeah, this is not your pastor, not your father, not your husband, not your employer. God Himself has said this. What did He say? Here's what it is. And, and I believe there are people here tonight, you need to take this as a personal prophetic word for you right now. Here's what it is. He said, I will not in any way fail you, nor give you up, nor leave you without support. I will not, I will not, I will not in any degree leave you helpless, nor forsake, nor let you down, relax my hold on you, assuredly not. So we take comfort and are encouraged and confidently and boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not be seized with alarm. I will not fear or dread or be terrified. What can man do to me? I, I mean, I will not, I will not, I will not. You can't get much more emphatic than that. I will not leave you, abandon you, forsake you, leave you without support. I love you far more than those birds. I'm taking care of the, bear, the sparrows and the birds. You're going to be okay. I want you to get a revelation of that, that we can really grab hold of that. And here's why I say that. If you don't get a revelation of sparrow faith, the reason that I'm going to be okay is because I am connected by covenant to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob who loves me and who has promised provision to me. If I don't get that as a revelation, do you know that it's going to taint everything else I do with finances? In other words, if I'm not secure in my heart, my Father loves me, I'm going to be okay. I'm going to work to try to get God to provide for me. I'm going to give to try to get God to provide for me. I'm going to tithe to try to get God to provide for me. I'm going to manipulate people to try to get provision for myself because deep inside is this insecurity and fear that I'm not going to be okay. Once the security comes, I'm okay. Now I can enter into many of those other things with a pure motive, with a pure motive. If my heart is not secure, then my motive is going to be tainted in everything else I do with money and finances. So when we're building a house that's not going to be knocked over by the wind and waves, the very first foundation, the, the concrete, the steel in this house is a revelation in the depths of the heart. My Father loves me and He will support me and never abandon me and provision comes to me for the vision that He's given me, but it's not dependent on my works. See, sowing and reaping causes provision to be dependent on my works. Does everybody see that? If I sow, I'm going to be provided for. If I don't, I'm going to starve to death. 
That's not Jesus' model. Again, I'm not saying sowing and reaping is not a correct thing to do. It's just for a different purpose. I've got to get a revelation in my heart. No, provision comes to me by grace. The same way anything that you've ever received from God. I mean, what did you do to deserve salvation? What did you do? What works did you do to receive healing, to receive anything from God? See, the truth is, anything you've ever received from God came to you because He loves you by His grace. And, and all you did was open your hands and say, thank you. And you received it. You didn't do any great thing. You didn't sow and reap. You just received it. And provision works exactly the same way. Let's just close this in prayer. Father, we thank you for this time. I pray that you begin to speak to us deep on the inside. Begin to show us what we need to do to break the power of the spirit of mammon. To serve you. Lord, begin to give us revelation. What is the vision that you've given us? What do we need money for? What is the purpose? And Father, I pray that you just begin to stir our hearts with those things that you want to accomplish within us, even during this break. I thank you for doing it in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Okay, let's take our break.